Dad, wake up. Dad? What's this? Hi, this is Mick Make Mail number 12 with lots and lots of really cool stuff. P.S. Please turn off the camera. Oh. So this mailbag, we're taking a look at this, 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 and this. So a lot of these things were in previous mailbags. Um, the Wii Thumbs, Logic Analyzer, and Dust Sensors, they were all from, I think, almost uh, six months ago. So I just haven't had time to actually run through a proper test of these things. I've been using this one for some time, but I actually haven't had a chance to test these things out. So anyway, let's have a look at them. So this one came from a Micmac Mail uh, number one, I think. It was the very first one. And it's a fingerprint sensor from Shenzhen to you. They say it's based on the FPC1020, but if you look very closely, you can see it's an STM32 MCU. So what they're doing is they're decoding the SPI interface coming from the sensor and providing it as a straight uh, TTL UART out through here. There's a bit of confusion between their diagram on the website which states that there's only six pins here. So I'm going to have to do a bit of investigation on this one to find out what pins are connected to what. So they provide two cables. One they claim to be able to connect to a standard Grove connector and another one which is well, just a straight pass through. You'll see that the connection for the Grove connector doesn't match the pinout that they provide on their website. So what I've managed to cobble together is a Raspberry Pi uh, 2, sorry, a Raspberry Pi 1, which of course doesn't have the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module on board, which means also that I can connect to the, the UART port. I've managed to figure out the first four connections are the most important, uh, being ground, RX, TX and power. So I've sort of loosely wired it up. There's also a fifth connection, which is an interrupt, uh, which I'll eventually connect up, but I need to get the basics working. So it's crow time. Thank goodness I got a new crow. And let's see what this thing's doing. Okay, so this is a little bit unexpected. I've connected up the TX pin. I'm not seeing any change at all. So theoretically, I should be able to put my finger on, and there should be some data that goes backwards and forwards. But I'm seeing this really weird, consistent clock, which is not right. There's something bizarre going on here. Okay, back to the drawing board. Okay, so I've connected up the RX pin, and I'm pressing carriage return on the keyboard, and it's, I'm certainly getting an RX signal out. So the first things you need to find out when you're buzzing out a circuit board is ground. That's probably the first thing. Um, because we've got a nice juicy crystal oscillator, uh, the case is usually ground, um, and then we can look at buzz out the rest of them. Okay, so pin four. So going down from here, it's pin four. Um, now if we look at the so-called Grove connector, um, what they've done is it actually connects uh, this way but I think what they've done is the ground on pin 4 but they've put it around this way so someone's done a little dodgy on this one it's ended up having these pins reversed so I'm hoping that that's ground that's power uh, that's either RX or TX and that's RX so I can still buzz those out so what I did before was apply ground to there VCC to there which is actually ground so hopefully I haven't damaged it uh, so let's uh, connect it all up and see so now I'm going to work backwards uh, if I'm going to trust that so-called Grove connector that's been reversed so since this STM32 chip is a 3.3 volt device they've more than likely got a voltage regulator on here uh, from 5 to 3.3 volts so if you look at the data sheet uh, this is 3.3 volts in um, and this is the voltage regulator and I would expect one of these ones okay so that's VCC coming in so then we work backwards from that without even looking at the data sheet um, I'm just assuming one of these pins will be connected to the input voltage supply so okay that's, so the middle pin is ground okay so we've at least we've got the ground and VCC so ground and VCC are the two middle pins working from the top down it's uh, pin 4 and 5 uh, it looks like as I assumed the Grove connector was actually correctly wired but ran the wrong way so they thought that the connector was going in this way but it actually goes in this way so a bit of rewiring and uh, let's see how it goes 
you sort of just got to get in underneath underneath the little tab and then pull it out it sort of comes out eventually like that so I want to reverse these pins around completely and they should just slot back in again with, uh, without too much trouble it's always good to just double check everything okay that's good okay perfect let's go if this is the TX I should be able to see some sort of response coming out of this crow. Set my crow to single shot mode. Uh, so I'll be able to capture any sort of rising and falling edges just so I can see if there's anything coming out from anywhere. So let's uh, poke around a bit. So what I'm doing is just putting my finger on the sensor and it sh I should see something coming out. So I'm not really getting anything. Okay, so I think I've completely buggered this STM32 up. According to their diagram, it goes ground RXTX VCC, but according to uh, me buzzing it out, this is ground, that's VCC. So just a word of caution, if you're coming across a board that you are a bit dubious about, you don't know the connections, buzz it out first. Don't go into it and connect everything up. It's a real shame because had I actually buzzed it out properly, I would have realised that VCC and ground were actually around the wrong way. So I suspect I've completely buggered this up. Hopefully the, the capacitive touch module hasn't been buggered. Anyway, I might have some time later on this week to have another look at it and then I might review this again in another Mick Make Mail. Anyway, next one. So here's another one I've had for a while. Uh, one of my mates who actually started this Kickstarter, the STEM Terror. If you haven't seen this before, it's quite a great idea. It's a it's essentially a breadboard that has an Arduino compatible inbuilt. So it's it's pretty good. You can either power it by DC or USB. Uh, the other good thing is that it's Lego compatible. So hang on, let me go and get some Lego. Okay, so I got some Lego. And look, it just connects straight in, which is pretty nice. So it just sort of expands the possibilities. Hope my kids don't get annoyed at me for destroying their Lego creation. So um, look, that's pretty good. Connects to any of the Lego stuff. Let's uh, crack it open and see what's inside. I actually need to get some uh, guitar picks. So that's, that's the insides of it. Looks pretty nice. So you can see the Atmega 328P uh, and the Atmega 16U2. I think they've changed it to a 32U4. This is a pre-Kickstarter prototype that was sent to me by JP Lou, uh, who's a creator. So it's quite a nice little board. So let's put it through its paces and see how it goes. So I thought I'd start off with an LCD display. Uh, just get straight into it. Of course I've had to put some headers on because the uh, connector down here it just gets in the way unfortunately uh, so that'll fit in quite nicely so let's chuck it on and power it up eh? so before we get onto that the stem terror works like any other Arduino you know so I just plug it in you can see I've just programmed the stem terror with a st standard blinky application so let's try out the LCD screen so let's see if it actually works ah nice look at that perfect so any, essentially any hat that you want to put on, it'll just work straight off because it's uh, Arduino Uno compatible. It just, you know, everything will just bolt on and just work nice. So in terms of the connections, you've got the standard Arduino Uno compatible there. Um, and then you've got the, the other Atmega 32U4 there. You've got a whole bunch of uh, GPOs that you can access without any problem. So it seems that uh, these rails aren't powered by 5 volts or 3.3 volts so they're free for you to cross over the the power lines and make them either 5 volts or 3.3 volts so the Atmega 32U4 acts as a bridge between your PC and the Atmega 328P you can actually use additional GPIOs from the Atmega 32U4 that's an advanced topic I looked at JP Lou's website I couldn't actually see any information on that so I might ask him about that and um, get back to you. Excellent, so that's uh, looking quite good. So that's the STEM Terror and if you want to pick up one of these uh, I think it's available at Spark Fun, Adafruit um, and also a couple of Australian stores as well. 
Um, so that's quite a nice little board if you want to do some experimentation and have it in a nice little uh, easy form factor. Anyway, so what do we have next? So here's another one that I didn't actually include in a mailbag uh, because it was sent to me by uh, one of my mates, uh, Keen Mazels, who runs a consulting company called Keen Electronics uh, in Mount Karingai. It's a Smarty Pie Touch and I thought I'd put it all together and see what it's like. Let's crack it open. You get all the mounting points, the Lego sort of piece, all these sort of mounting points. This is for a camera, cables, banner, oh yeah, double HDMI cable as well. Oh, and this is the screen, uh, which is a straight seven inch uh, touch display. Uh, of course you get all the cables uh, and everything else that you, that you need. So it's quite a nice big screen. So let's put it all together and see what it looks like. So the first problem I see is this USB connector here is, well you can't access it because there's a bit of plastic here. This is a power out connector so I don't think it's going to be an issue but you can always just cut the bit of plastic off here. So these uh, mounting points are really if you want to mount it to a wall or something. So I don't really need that, I just want to connect the case up. So then screw the LCD screen of the Smarty Pie case. And the fourth screw is underneath the, the panel, just here. There you go, Bob's your uncle. The Raspberry Pi will of course uh, sit in here, uh, quite snugly, uh, located on those little pips. Of course, if you want to be able to connect up your screen, you need to be able to connect up the ribbon cable first. So let's just undo it all and um, put it back on again, eh? Now when connecting the LCD panel cable, make sure you get it up the right way. It goes up this way and slots in. And then just screw it up again. And then just a case of putting on the back panel, just to make sure it all fits in there. There's two ways of powering up the LCD screen. You can either connect it uh, using these cables uh, that are supplied, or else uh, you can use this cable, which is a just a double power cable. So of course, it one connects into here, uh, into the LCD screen, and the other one, of course, connects into the Raspberry Pi. Less fiddly than having to connect up uh, these cables. So the Raspberry Pi camera module is fairly easy to install into this little thingy. Just make sure you put it on the little tabs. Uh, make sure you you push the, the camera module out this hole as opposed to the hole at the back because it interferes with everything. There you go. Now it's got a Lego back on it. You need to get some sort of Lego pieces. So let's go and find some Lego pieces. You know it's funny how whenever you want to find a Lego piece you can never find it and when you don't want to find it, especially in the middle of the night and barefoot, you always seem to manage to find it. So this is the best I could come up with, a cranky little man. But already I can see a problem here, is that the cable isn't long enough. Um, you can get a Smarty Pi with the Lego insert there, so you can mount the camera on the front using a, a Lego piece like this. Um, but I, I didn't get one of those. So let's fire it up and see how it goes. Of course, when you first power it up, the Raspberry Pi should just recognise it all and uh, just work straight off. And there you have it, straight up, nice. You can use a mouse or it's a touch, so quite a nice little container uh, if you want to have uh, your Raspberry Pi just self-contained. Nice little box and you have access to all the GPIOs off there. Okay, I think we need to look at the next thing now. So there's one last thing before I go. A number of my subscribers had issues with the uh, pulse oximeter. Uh, this was a review I did some time ago. You were essentially getting, I think, 35 beats per minute. So this is the same setup that I had in my last video. Uh, the same oximeter, pulse oximeter. Um, and you can see what I'm getting is a fairly consistent pulse. Now I'm using a Teensy LC. I wasn't using an Arduino. Uh, I think a number of you have been using an Arduino, so 
I'll retry my tests again using an Arduino instead of a Teensy LC. So here we have exactly the same setup using an Arduino Leonardo and if you if I put my finger on on the sensor it reads you know roughly 80 90 beats per minute so I can confirm it actually works with that issue uh, both on Arduino Leonardo and also a Teensy LC so I'm not sure why um, those people are getting those sort of issues um, bear in mind that I had to put a, a pull up um, on the I2C bus it's a 10k you don't really need a 10k you can probably get by with a 4 4.7 kilo ohm pull-ups um, it needs to be on 5 volts so make sure you um, tie it to 5 volt line not 3.3 volts so possibly that might have been an issue um, but look I, ca I can confirm that it actually does work works well um, and there's no issue there